everyone. Welcome to the Parts Girl podcast. I have Austin Conroy with me. Welcome, Austin. Happy to have you. <laughs> yeah, happy to be here. Thanks, Kaylee. Yeah. So uh, first, let's introduce you and what your role is with your dealer group and where you're at, and, and then we'll go from there. Yeah, so I work for the Rorman Automotive Group. I am a regional fixed operations director, so uh, based out of Lafayette, Indiana. And then uh, there's also a, a store in Indianapolis that I help with too. So brands would be Hyundai, Honda, Toyota, and Kia. And then there's also a collision center in there too. So, Wow, that's a lot. Okay. I feel like we could talk about so many things because you're not just one brand and you're regional. So that must mean that you guys are fairly large. Yeah, we are. Yeah, we have plenty, 20 plus rooftops. There's a big presence up in Chicagoland area. And then we also have a few more stores in Fort Wayne area. And there, there's two in Indianapolis. So Okay. And how long have you been with the group? I've been with the group a little over seven years now. So I started, I actually started on the sales floor. So kind of an interesting journey through very I remember that. Yeah. 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 So I, I originally started selling cars and then worked through like sales management uh, finance manager. And then we just had this crazy idea one day that I went to bed a finance manager and woke up a service manager of the, the Toyota store. So it was I really would interesting. Love, I would love to know like what transpired. Like, I know you didn't just wake up the next day. <laughs> like what, what made you want, or like as a whole, what, why the change? Yeah, I think, you know, the finance role for me was, I, I was okay in finance, but it was it was more of an individual contributor type role, which it didn't really fit. I think like my career goals as well. So, you know, I really loved being a part of a team. I loved the leadership and management aspect of it. So, the general manager and director of operations at the time said, "Hey, you know, we're not happy with what's going on in service right now. Would you have any interest in becoming a service manager?" And I, I'll tell you the truth, like I. I couldn't have even told you what a repair order was at that point. And I don't work on cars. I'm not really a car guy at heart. That's going to crush a lot of people. I'm in the car business. But yeah, so I legitimately, it was just a conversation we had over the next couple of weeks. And then we said, let's do it. So I legitimately, I was a finance manager end of the month. And then the next day I was, I was a service manager. So it was a, okay. it was a lot of fun, a lot of learning. I've got, I've got lots of questions because, yeah. okay, so where we're, we're going to kind of like full circle where we're at now, because where you are now, I think you guys have created a really great culture. You mm -hmm. have a good relationship with parts and service. I can mm -hmm. see that with what you guys share. Um, so I have to say, like, I think if a service like service advisors woke up the next day and their finance manager was their service manager, I'm sure there was a lot of like, what the heck is this guy doing in charge of us? <laughs> So, yeah, there, there was a lot of people like within the group that were saying that too. It was it, it was pretty funny. And I was like, what are these guys thinking? So I think, you know, part of it is what I think the culture here is, you know, we hire great people and then we want to find the best seat on the bus for them. So, you know, there's there's a couple other stories like mine that, you know, we've recreated and it, it's just a lot of fun. And it's a lot of fun in the the car business, especially being like a family owned business we're able to take some chances and take some risks that you probably wouldn't get with a corporate structure, right? So I just had a parts manager actually two weeks ago that I promoted to oversee two stores. So, wow. um, you know, we had a vacancy and then we were able to fill it and kind of reward him. And then now we're going to be able to give a couple counter people at the other stores opportunities to become assistant managers and continue to grow. So, you know, my story is you know, one of one of many that we have in the group of, you know, mine may might be a little bit more dramatic than some of the other ones, but you know, that's that's our MO. That's what we love to do. So whether it's retooling a salesperson to be a service advisor, uh, you know, because we get that a lot where yeah. somebody is really great when they're in front of customers, but not so great, you know, at at actively reaching out and, and grinding away with the leads to, to get people in, you know, and then on the parts side of it, we've had a couple different technicians that we've moved back into a parts role. Oh, you know, it's yeah, that's kind of great. one of those, one of those changes that you wouldn't really think of until you do it one time and you're like, Whoa, this actually really fits, you know, cause they, you know, I've actually, I've actually seen that a lot with techs going to part, especially like the more seasoned techs that, you know, their body just can't do it anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, they know parts, they know. Yeah. So I think that's a great thing. And again, the, the younger techs too, that maybe they don't want to grind or they're just not quite getting there from a flat rate 
you know, perspective, you're able to give them more stability and then, you know, something that something that's a little bit more up their alley. So we that's true, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. That's awesome. But you didn't answer my question. <laughs> what? <laughs> Full circle. How did they treat you? Finance manager, service manager. How did they treat you? Yeah. So luckily. How did you turn that culture around? I got yeah. I, I mean, luckily I, I had good relationships with people in service and just, yeah. you know, working at the dealership prior to that, you know, everyone kind of knows you. It's, it's a family, That's right? Good. I mean, we had yeah. 40, 45 employees at that point. So it was, you know, it was easy to kind of be in the mix and everybody knew who you, you know, knew who you were at that point. So, you know, luckily I'd had a good reputation, so it wasn't as hard, but, you know, there definitely were some barriers the first couple months of this guy doesn't know anything about this. But, you know, once I started to catch on and kind of ask the right questions and know where to look, you know, they were like, oh, okay, he, you know, he's, he's trying to improve things. He's, he's trying to move it forward and, and really manage it. So, you know, and then COVID happened. So, I mean, I hate to say it, but it was it was kind of nice to be able to retool and kind of come back and instill a lot of processes. You know, I think a lot of times it's hard to get new processes going just day to day. But we really kind of had a set, you know, cutoff there of COVID where I was one of many that got furloughed for at least a week, you know, and, and came back. And but then I was able to really start new with processes and start fresh and we were able to really ramp up. So. You know, I'd never want that to happen again, but just in my experience, it, it, it definitely helped to kind of restart and jumpstart the service department. So. Yeah. I mean, it's this hard thing to like look back at and during that time, like, so I feel like life went by so fast, but so slow. And, um, there was, there was a lot of good that came out cause we did slow down and we were able to really look at like kind of the basics and. Yeah, yeah, a lot of the, you know, the technological advancements and then I think advancements in yeah. customer service and just how we're viewing those relationships and what we do with pickup and drop offs and, mm -hmm. you know, the the payment links and, and all the yeah. different technologies now with the multi-point inspection videos. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that had COVID not happened, I don't think the rate of advancement would have been so quick in terms of some of these technologies that we've we've adopted, so... I completely agree. I think even just the simple way that we do business and partner with each other has completely changed in the way that we network, the way that we present, the way that we do things. It's all so fast now. We don't have, I mean, in person is better, but like yeah. this fast forward. I mean, I remember, I think they were just launching like grocery pickup when COVID was kind of happening. And then now they can deliver it to your door. Yeah, I mean, great. it's like parents, it's now it's like, well, why wouldn't we get our groceries delivered? You know, or, or why wouldn't you just pull up to Target and they just put your groceries in the back? Like, why didn't we think of that? Why didn't we think of that? And then in the car, like mobile, I don't know. Are you guys into mobile at all? You know, we're not. I My take on mobile, I would love to do it, but I, I feel like we're caught in this, this conundrum where like the manufacturers other than Ford, yeah. they don't really want to pay for it which Ford is getting to the point where they don't want to pay for it anymore. The customer doesn't really want to pay for it either. And then the dealer doesn't really want to pay for it either. So I think there is going to be a breaking point there at some point. You know, I, I saw a mobile oil change company that just started in our town. And so it kind of really piqued my interest to look at what does their operation look like and different things. But, you know, there's a lot of capital to start up with the van. Um, you know, systems run your appointments. You got to pay the technician. You know, what do you do about parts? Right. You pre-order those. So I, I think there's definitely a lot of hurdles to get started, but I, I'm watching it very closely because I don't want to be behind that trend. But I I don't feel like I want to be a, a guinea pig on it either, if that makes sense. That makes sense. And it's essentially like managing another business within your business, just like the wholesale is for parts and mm -hmm. I think even online sales. So with the with the mobile service, I think there's opportunity there and we have to look at, you know, we end up actually paying more when they deliver it, but we don't actually see it. Like no. they put it through their like membership. So I feel like there might be opportunity. I don't know how to achieve it. And this might be mm -hmm. so far fetched, but like a membership type of format with, with dealerships. I don't know. It's, there might be something there. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> it's yeah. memberships everywhere. Yeah. I, I think the next, you know, the next year or two is going to be really telling for mobile service. I, I know there's some, you know, bigger metro areas that have had a lot of success with it, um, different brands. But again, I think it takes 
lot of startup capital. And then I think you do have to have uh, a big opportunity in terms of, you know, how many cars you can service. So like, you know, my Lafayette region, I may have 700 open recalls, you know, with a particular brand, but down in Indianapolis, it could be three times that amount, you know, you could have 2100. So it's really just, it's about making a business decision at the end of the day, you know, there's going to be some risk there, you got to have someone that's entrepreneurial to kind of run it, that has the bandwidth to do it. So I'm making a lot of excuses, but no, no, but you're making, they're not excuses. I think you're looking at it a whole big picture. It's not something you can just like put your foot in. Like it's something that you would probably have to actually have another physical person to manage. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's a good thing to talk about. Um, I would like to ask, you know, based on the way the year has started for you guys, I'm, I'm hearing continuous record months, um, but we also have this like I think even more of this more scared mindset than even when COVID was happening, because it's mm. just like this weirdness of, I don't know, the economy, everything. So what are your thoughts on that? And how are you guys just just putting your head down and keep going? Yeah, I think what, what we've really seen as a trend, you know, we've really worked hard on controlling what we can control in terms of our gross profit percentages. And this goes not only with service, but also with parts departments. You know, I think a lot of that goes into pursuing manufacturer rate increases. So in terms of our year over year performance, we've, we've had an extremely hot start in service and parts. I think a couple areas that make me a little nervous is, you know, continuing to chase the customer pay RO counts, you know, trying to find creative ways. How do we advertise? How do we market? You know, what are, what are we doing with our maintenance services to get people in the door? And that, that involves pricing, right? Price points. We're constantly mis mystery shopping our competitors in the area to see where they're at doing dare to compare boards, everything we can get. But, you know, we're at the point now where it's like, we got to get more cars in the drive. You know, and I think on the the parts side, the wholesale business has been really interesting this year. You know, with with the Collision Center, I think we've, we've done a decent job of profitability year over year, but it seems like that business has really slowed a lot. So there's not as much new coming in the door. And then, you know, I've seen our, our parts departments are a little bit down in wholesale. It's It's hit or miss, but I think with the, you know, weather plays a huge, huge role in it. We had a very warm uh, winter here in Indiana, so we didn't, we didn't get as much of the the dicey weather that tends to, to bring in more, more collision center business. More so, accidents, yeah. yeah. I, I would say that those are the, you know, the two areas that we continue to push and try to find, you know, opportunities of, you know, what platforms are we using to, uh, to make it easier for people to buy parts from us, and then, you know, what platforms are we using from an advertising standpoint, retention yeah. with customer pay. Uh, so if you have any answers on that, I'd love to hear it. But <laughs> Well, I was just going to ask you, what have you found that's worked for you? I mean, you can shout out anyone. I, I don't, I mean. Yeah, I mean, I if, yeah, if I'm going to shout out a couple, uh, Sunbit has been a huge tool for us in terms of financing. It's been incredible to get that on board. They integrate very well with Techion. I'm obviously a huge advocate and, and partner for Techion. I think that, you know, that tool has has added so much simplicity and customization to our lives. It's incredible. Uh, we were just talking to an advisor that that we onboarded last week, and you know, the first day he's writing repair orders from start to finish. And wow. you know, same thing with parts counter people. You know, it's it's a point and click system. It's super easy to get up and running. So, yeah, Sunbit Sunbit's been a huge key to our success as well as Tachyon. And then, you know, we have a couple other things working with some different marketing companies. I'm I'm not going to shout out yet because I don't a hundred. Oh, that's fair. It. You know, I'm, yeah. I'm excited to get going with them and, and see what kind of business right. we can drive. So. Yeah, marketing is important. You got to, it's just part of business. Yeah, and I think the, you know, the next phase too, which which will be interesting, the some of this connected TV advertising that you can do now with, uh, you know, everybody, everybody's watching Hulu and the Disney Pluses and the Prime Videos and, and everything. So I know there's a manufacturer that had a has a big deal right now with Disney. And they're trying to do yeah. connected services with, you know, Disney's platform. So we're really looking into that, too. I I made some silly videos from time to time, but, you know, we're looking at, hey, could we kind of make this sustainable with, you know, our different social strategies and then maybe getting back to where you're doing like some TV advertisements. So, yeah, because I mean, TV is not what it used to be. It's totally different with the subscriptions and where mm -hmm. people are hanging out and you know, I think I just even saw a post April Simmons with Horn. She posted about how social marketing is just like, that's where it's at. Like with 
because that's where we're hanging out. Like, Mm -hmm. you know, my downtime when I want to be a vegetable and not think about anything, I'm looking at funny videos and not, you know, sometimes I learn though when I'm watching those videos because there's some interesting stuff. But (laughs) yeah, and I think when you look at from an advertising standpoint, and we were always looking to maximize the ROI and, you know, the spend on social is very low. You know, you can produce videos very easily. They, we don't have to bring a production company in with the big equipment and the lights. I mean, it's literally a cell phone and a little microphone. And, you know, you can shoot a stupid tire video like I posted, you know, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, Those it, are the best videos because I honestly, when I see that something looks super professional, I just, I don't want to see it because I know it's like an advertisement. Yeah, it doesn't <laughs> so. seem as genuine. So, exactly. you know, I think if you're, it, it, when you get into targeting with social and, you know, and some of this connected TV stuff, it, it gets a little pricier, but it it's not like a broad brush that you're painting. I mean, you're being very strategic with, with who you're, who you're targeting. Yeah. I would love to find out how you guys, you know, play with that and figure that out because I haven't heard very many dealerships talking about that in in that space of just, you know, advertising on Disney or Hulu because. Yeah, I think it's kind of a newer trend. And I noticed, again, I noticed one manufacturer was really leaning into it. So then we kind of started to, to look into it a little bit more and realizing the capabilities of it's kind of creepy, like how you can target <laughs> target people with any marketing oh, and data. I mean, it is. It makes me I just know. want to shut everything off. I'm not going to. I know. Because, okay, because we have, you have kids, I have kids. So I'm on Disney, I'm on Hulu. And so um, just some of the ads that pop up, I'm like, how did they know we were just talking about Cause, this? Because you sign in, you sign in with what? An email. An email. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> I won't get too deep into it, but that's how you can target people. <laughs> Oh yeah. They, yeah, and I'm, I'm. I mean, I'm kind of okay with it because yeah, I want to see stuff that I am interested in. Oh, so for sure. Yeah. Target me, whatever. But it's a little creepy, and I think more, too because I'm working with dealerships, so I'm researching dealerships all the time. So I think they always think I want to buy a car. <laughs> yes, <laughs> you're you gonna clear cookies like every day. Yeah, so I probably should. Keep retargeting. They're like, oh, she wants a Toyota today. Oh no, Ford. <laughs> like. <laughs> It's funny. Um, all right. So let's talk about bridging gaps with service and parts. Cause yeah. I, I, I've seen your guys' videos. You have a really good time with your parts, people and service. So I would like to know just kind of like, how do you, what do you, why is there gaps and how do you not have them? Yeah. I think, you know, when I, when I was working as a Toyota service manager for a couple of years, it, you know, I was lucky to have a parts manager that had been doing it for a long time. And, you know, he had, he had a great inventory. He had everything dialed in in terms of ordering. But then when I got in in more of a, you know, this like platform director role and I started looking at other departments, it was like, man, there's there's such a divide here. And I know that, you know, management, corporates, like pay plans solve everything. They help. But, they you know, help. we've we've actually started to, from a pay plan perspective, we're, we're paying parts managers on service. So, yes, you know, yeah. one, of, one of the biggest things you see is like, well, I'm not discounting that part because that hurts me or I'm not doing that, you know, but hey, let's look at this holistically. Let's tie parts into service because, you know, realistically, I think the the parts department can be really a gas pedal or a brake for the service department. So we want them on board on the gas. We want them to stock and be incentivized to stock more parts, bring in more parts of what we need. you know. Yeah. And then we also need them incentivized to work deals too and find aftermarket options when when they're not available. So yeah. you know, we've, we, the pay plan change helps. But you know, then what else helps is we have a, a corporate program called the Infinite Pursuit that we do every year. And so a lot of the metrics within service and parts are tied together. And then you know, the meetings that we have service and parts are together. So we yeah. kind of quit referring to them as service and parts departments. And we truly are looking at them as fixed ops. Um, yeah. You know, I'm, I'm very rarely uh, sitting down with just one of the managers unless we have something very specific with their department to go over. So I think those are some of the little changes that, it, that have led, you know, over the last couple of years, we've had, you know, really good relationships between uh, service and parts and, and able to break down those barriers. So. Yeah, I think that's the biggest thing, too. I, I hear Mike Weldon with Hansel always saying, you know, it's fixed. It's not parts and service. And I think, to having both managers in on the conversations makes a huge difference because they, they affect each other. One thing I didn't I wanted to make sure to to ask was, do you guys pay service on parts, too? Like, is it like 
participate do on not. services? You don't. Okay. We don't. That's no. interesting. So, Why did you so, guys choose that? You know, because I feel like I feel like from a parts standpoint, I, I've seen parts departments hold back service quite a bit sometimes, yeah. right? And again, it's it's more that mentality of of holding them back. I've never really seen. I think service naturally pulls along the parts department. So, you know, in our opinion, if we have service focused on the right metrics, which you know is going to be kind of an overall gross profit number, controlling policy, and then you know for the advisors to push the hours because we know if we sell more hours, we're going to sell more parts too with that, mm -hmm. right? So I think it's just easier for us to let's tie parts into service, but we don't necessarily have an issue with service, you know, needing to get That's paid off, fun. getting paid off of parts. That makes sense. Okay. The only reason why I asked was when I've seen other dealerships pay service on parts, mm -hmm. service is a little bit more understanding with how they affect the health of the inventory. Because that's the only, the always the thing is service and the technicians want you to stock everything. And mm -hmm. parts is like, uh, I don't know, that's going to screw up the health. Yeah. So there's like that. That's where that I think that barrier comes in. But I think what yeah, you guys are working. Yeah. Yeah. And we're we're we'll still looking, you know, for parts departments, holding them accountable to turn rates, you know, which involves inventory valuation and how much you're selling. And then, yeah. you know, the other thing that tying them to the months no sale. So, you know, making yeah. sure that they, you know, some people call it obsolescence, months no sale, same difference, I think, for me. So, you know, making sure that they are controlling their inventory well. So they are, that department's directly held responsible for that. So we can keep them in check and, and just say, hey, we want you to have this much in inventories. A lot of the manufacturers are really good with like the parts eye program. I know it's a big one that really helps you bring in the right things. And then it's protected from a manufacturer standpoint. So some of them like Toyota has an extremely generous return policy. Yes, they do. Uh, you know, so stocking those items is a little bit more manual for us, but, you know, Techion helps a lot with that and just different parameters we can set, not to get too deep into it, but, you know, different source codes and different part numbers yeah. you can set. It is you're, in the weeds as you want to language. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, you know, even a manufacturer like Honda, we set some floor mats. It's like, hey, we need to have three sets of these floor mats in stock at all times. So yeah. you know, when, when I get down to two, it's going to order me back up to three and, you know, all that can be set as granular as you want it, you know, within Techion. So yeah, Techion, you can do a lot with that. You can do a lot with all the DMSs really. Yeah. It's just managing it after it's all set up. So, yeah. and that's the, that's the word I use all the time. It's granular. <laughs> it's a good it word. I mean, it's, you know, it's, that's one of the things I've struggled with this, with this role. I, I can't be in the weeds you know, or as granular as I'd like to be sometimes, you know, it's yeah. more, more kind of overseeing just some higher level metrics and then diving in as I need to. But yeah, you know, that the parts role is extremely administrative and it is extremely detail oriented that, you know, the best parts managers I know, you know, they are spreadsheet Kings <laughs> and Queens, you know, it's Thank like, yeah. they keep the inventory clean. They're constantly sweeping. They're constantly, you know, they got their special order parts shelves under control. Oh, yeah. so. Don't even talk about their special order shelf. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she said, you walk in, let me see your shelf. No, it's clean. It's good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, no, it's not. <laughs> no, it's not. What is the oldest part on that? <laughs> yeah. And that's and then, another. Oh, yeah. That's go kind of go back to our other conversation. You know, that's yeah. been another benefit of tying parts to service because they yeah. get paid on the hours when that part gets installed. So, you know, we've seen a, a significantly more responsibility taken from the parts department in actually proactively reaching out to customers and texting them and calling them and setting appointments out of the parts department for special order parts. And I love it, you know. Yeah, that's I mean, of course, that should be because it's tied to service. You know, they're like they're motivated, you know, like, let's get these parts to these customers. Yeah. It makes a huge difference. I've even seen like parts just like looking ahead at the schedule and just like making sure, you know, the parts are there for the service appointments so that, you know, because there's a lot of communication that happens in, internally that needs to happen and sometimes it gets missed. So, I've yeah, really I mean, even looking at used cars, you know, talk about getting ahead, yeah. you know, the better they are with the operations because these the used car buyers uh, and inventory managers, they know what VINs are going to be coming in from the auction house. So. The yeah. parts managers get access to that. They can go ahead and order, you know, mostly it's it's going to be off-brand things. They're going to order from like a Napa or O'Reilly. Hey, let's go ahead and get that here. So then it's on the shelf. You know, it's going to reduce our turn time once the car gets here. So those are, again, some of the more proactive things that I've seen happen over the last couple of years as we've, 
we've broken down the walls, so to speak, and, and made it more of a fixed ops department. Yeah, I totally, that's, that's the whole thing is I've seen that too, just working together because even that was like the biggest thing too, is like used car salespeople and parts, <laughs> Yep. You know, you get the cars and they're like, I don't want to, I don't want to help you. Yep. But it's yep. like, yeah, for, we're all working together to push and get sales and, and make, make money. Yep. <laughs> That's how we can survive. <laughs> um, so, okay. So is there anything that you feel like um, really helps you in your day or just keep um, on top of everything? Cause you're overseeing how many rooftops? Was it like six or seven? Six, six, six. Yeah. yeah. So that's a lot <laughs> to manage. And then you probably have, you know, times two or three of however many managers. Mm -hmm. So how do you control all of that? How do you keep your organized? Yeah. So, you know, luckily we have a really good reporting structure. So, you know, a role like mine is all about checking my traps. That's a kind of a phrase that we use a lot. So it's, it's knowing what traps to check and when to check them. So you know, there's things that I look at daily. There's things that I'm going to look at on a weekly basis and then, you know, other things on a monthly basis. So typically, you know, store visits you know, are going to revolve around, you know, staffing and just kind of continuing those relationships. It's, it's a lot harder to get in depth with those relationships. You know, one of the struggles I had moving out of a management role, you know, more of a director role is, you know, you do lose touch with the employees. It's, it's fun to see them every day and sit down with them and know, you know, how yeah. their day went and, oh, yeah, you were taking your kid there last night. You know, how'd that go? You know, those relationships become a lot harder in a role like this, but they're they're still important. You know, it may it may be just a fist bump as I'm walking through the shop now, you know, and, instead of like a sit down conversation. But, you know, I, I would say for the most part, you know, you're you're plugging in, you're plugging holes sometimes. You know, I've been at the Toyota store this week as the manager's out on vacation and, you know, just just plugging in as I can, you know, and then helping with higher level things like staffing. So, you know, I have five stores essentially in, in one town. So, you know, I'm able to recruit people and then say, Hey, I think you'd be a good fit at this store. Or I know we're looking at somebody from this store or this store. So that's really where I, where I try to plug in, checking the traps and then really helping with, you know, from a group perspective, whether it's uh, recruiting or, or marketing. Yeah, no, that's, that's good. And that's how you can keep, you know, your involvement and, you know, making sure that people know that you're there. And I think it's too, like what you said, when you can uh, plug in and be like, you know, fill in, that's a, that's a huge thing. Cause then you're like, okay, I'm here, you know, work. You should probably do it. Even if someone's not out, just kind of like. I, every time I do, I, I'm like, yeah, I should, because, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of things that employees come and tell you. And then yeah. it's very good constructive criticism for the manager, you know, when they get back. So, exactly. you know, and then I try not to, I get involved in some customer cases, right? <laughs> but I, I try not to get too many of those coming to me, but I do always love being back in the store and working with customers too. You know, there's, oh, yeah. there's some that I, you know, I still know and keep in relationships from back from even when I was selling cars. Wow. Uh, I just had one reach out to me that I haven't talked to them in five or six years, really, since I got a sales, they came in and bought a couple cars from Toyota. And so those, those things are always fun. You know, again, that's the fun part of the business. So I, it is. I wish I could spend more time with employees and I, I do still miss kind of that customer interaction side of it. I, I don't get as much as I'd like, but. Yeah. Yeah, I, I can feel that. I think when I went over, I mean, this is a long time ago when I left Subway and went into like an office environment mm -hmm. where the customers were over the phone, it was just like, you miss that face-to-face -face customer, your regulars and mm -hmm. yeah, that interaction. So sometimes I, I still miss it. I'll I'll go work at a brewery locally just to get that face to face, yeah. <laughs> and it's fun to interact with people. They're not as angry about beer, you know. They're yeah, which <laughs> is they get pretty angry about. Yeah, uh, cars too. So. Very true. Yeah. Well, um, awesome. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Is there anything that you wanted to add, or anything you're really excited about as we are? about halfway through the year, which is crazy. No, I mean, I, you know, I think we're ramped up for a big year and, you know, we're super excited again, continue to develop our people, continue to develop our culture. So we've started celebrating some national days. So one I'm looking forward to this month, there's two national chocolate chip day is coming up soon. 
Then there's, I think it was a national burger day towards the end of the month. So burger day. We'll, uh, what? we'll have some fun social posts about that. Last month we had a national grilled cheese day, which was a lot of fun. So that's fun. Um, so what do you guys do on the national days? You guys just go, I mean, what do you do for grilled cheese day? So grilled cheese day, like we got a bunch of griddles and then uh, pretty much all the general managers or some directors that were just grilling up grilled cheese for all the employees. And we had tomato soup. And so the chocolate chip day, I think we're going to get a bunch of chocolate chip cookies we've done. National Eat Outside Day, where we had food catered to the stores and you know, all the employees get to eat outside. So, talking about culture, those are some fun things that, you know, when we first rolled the idea, I thought, oh, this is going to be a major flop. But, you know, everybody, they, they're fun now. And I celebrate them at home too with my family. <laughs> like, we had yeah. National Oreo Day, I think it was a couple months ago. So, yeah, there's been, okay. there's been some fun ones. So, the employees are really starting to look fun. forward to it now and it makes for yeah. some good social media posts. So, Absolutely. I think that's a, it's a fun, creative way to bring everyone together. And you don't really have to think of it. You know, you're like, what national day is it today? And then you can have fun with it. So I think that's a great idea. I don't see very many do like, consi like consistently a lot of the national days. So that's yeah. fun. It's <laughs> Where becoming do you a tradition over the last, we've almost been doing it a year. So it's wow. definitely been becoming a tradition. That's really cool. And they're getting and like you... bigger, they're getting bigger and bigger. <laughs> Everyone's like, what national day is it today? Yeah. Now it's like, we're going to order $500 worth of supplies, you know. And, but, Have a big party. So, yeah. okay, where do you find all these national days? I know there's some on calendars, but like, how do you? Just, if you Google know. it, it's wild. I mean, every, there's every day is a national day of something. I mean, it That's, is, it's exactly. absolutely wild. So yeah, every, everyone listen, you can just go Google what national days this month and you'll be amazed. Yeah. <laughs> There's multiples for one day. <laughs> so you yeah. Fit. Yeah. Very fun. Well, thank you again, Austin, for coming on this show. Yeah. I think a lot of people are going to get a lot from this. So Good. thank you. Thank you for joining us. Parts Edge, the power tool for your parts department. We hope you're leaving feeling motivated, challenged, and inspired. 